All right. We've got quite a few folks on the call, so um, I am going to go ahead and kick it off uh, if there are no objections. <laughs> um, this is Catherine Lyons. I'm the Manager of Policy and Coalitions for Economic Innovation Group. Uh, thank you all for joining us for today's webinar uh, about investing along Main Street in partnership with Main Street America. Um, I want to first uh, say that this is the first time that we are doing a webinar like this uh, from our various remote workspaces. So um, please just use the chat function, um, which I see a lot of you are already chiming in, chiming in with some nice good mornings and good afternoons. We appreciate that. Um, if you have any technical difficulties, can't hear us for, for whatever reason or not seeing the slides, please just let us know um, in, that, in that chat function um, so we can try to troubleshoot if possible. Um, so with that, I'm just going to open with a couple of housekeeping items um, and then turn it over to Rachel uh, to uh, kick us off. Um, one, the first uh, question that we often get uh, is, will this be recorded and will this recording be posted publicly and distributed after the, the call? The answer uh, to all of those questions is yes. So we are recording this webinar and we will be distributing it uh, to everyone who has registered for this um, after the call. Um, please give us just a couple of days uh, to edit it and get it up online um, with a corresponding blog post that recaps the conversation um, and we will send that out shortly thereafter. Um, and all right, uh, we will also be having time for question and answer afterward. Um, and uh, we will do so at the, at the end of all of the presentations. Um, so please uh, submit your questions throughout the presentations using the chat function. Um, for those who are perhaps calling in um, and, and not using the Zoom uh, webinar platform, um, we'll also open the phone line to it's just star six to unmute yourself at that point. Um, but we ask that you please try to hold questions um, at least uh, over the phone uh, until at the end of the presentation. Um, and we will be coalescing all the questions together at the end um, and answering them then. Um, so I believe that is most of the housekeeping uh, with one more reminder that I said a little bit earlier. Um, I believe most people or a lot of people, maybe more so than usual, are joining via their computer, um, which sometimes it's easier to uh, not see if you're uh, unmuted. Um, so please make sure uh, that you are muted, especially if you're using your computer audio, though, um, that goes for um, phones as well. Um, so. That will help us eliminate feedback, which I'm hearing a little bit of right now as well. So um, thank you in advance for your help with that. Um, all right. Well, I will turn it over um, to Rachel uh, to fill in anything I may have missed um, and maybe kick us off before um, getting started with the content. Yeah, thanks so much, Catherine. And just want to welcome everyone. Um, we're really excited to partner with Main Street America today on this webinar. Um, for folks that aren't familiar with the Economic Innovation Group, because I know that a number of Main Street America members and partners are probably joining us for the first time here, just wanted to share a little bit about who uh, Economic Innovation Group, who we are as an organization. So uh, throughout the webinar, you'll hear to us refer to EIG, that's us. Um, we are a bipartisan policy think tank located in Washington, D.C. And uh, really the, the crux of our work is focused around creating policies, uh, doing analysis, working with data to really help empower entrepreneurs and investors to activate them to create a more dynamic US economy. Uh, over the past couple of weeks, obviously we've been uh, looking to the various data to figure out how the current economic climate is going to impact uh, a lot of the small businesses that, that we frequent and that we care about. And so um, before we dive into the main content of the webinar, which is really around how opportunity zones can help revitalize Main Streets and how some uh, Main Street partners are already leveraging opportunity zones to, to revitalize their local communities and jumpstart economic growth, we wanted to provide um, some content and some updates around uh, how, how EIG is looking to provide information around the COVID-19 and the economy and especially impact, impacted businesses, as well as uh, what Main Street is doing as well. So with that, Catherine, uh, I'll turn it back over to you because you have been um, sort of in the throes of this at the federal level, tracking the federal relief efforts um, doing really great analysis around that, as well as um, 
looking forward to, to what may be coming down the pike as far as additional relief efforts from, from Congress. Yeah, thanks, Rachel. Um, so as Rachel mentioned, uh, EIG has been kind of actively involved in um, tracking and participating in some discussions um, that, uh, around the phase three stimulus package that was passed um, by Congress last week and signed into law by the president on Friday. Um, you know, we are anticipating that we'll see uh, at least a couple of more, a couple more stimulus packages or relief packages um, in the coming weeks. Um, but I uh, wanted to focus on what has been signed into law um, and what we may anticipate um, with regards to relief for uh, small businesses. Um, so EIG took a particular look at the Paycheck Protection Program, which is really sort of the, the capstone of what was provided um, in this phase three legislation for small businesses. Um, and I'll just go through um, a brief overview of uh, what the kind of um, the provisions provided in this program. Um, but of course, we have a longer blog post um, that we've linked to um, in the slides again, which will be uh, um, circulated after the call. Um, and uh, highly recommend going there for more details here, um, which includes a chart um, as well that hopefully kind of helps uh, put a lot of information into digestible format. Um, so first of all, I mean, the, these loans, um, these paycheck protection program loans, um, you know, will be administered by the Small Business Associate or Administration um, and as part of the, the 7A loan program, um, which many small businesses are likely familiar with, um, the covered loan period is between February 15th and, and June 30th of 2020. Um, and these are uh, the types of businesses that are eligible here are generally, and there are always kind of, there are exceptions and more details to um, a lot of these categories, which again, I would encourage you to go to the blog to get the, the full um, scope here. But um, for the purpose of just providing an overview on this call. Um, small businesses with less than 500 employees, um, sole proprietors and self-employed individuals, um, and nonprofits as well um, that meet the, that kind of size threshold. So, um, you know, they've kind of broadened that out um, a lot in terms of the eligible businesses. The maximum loan amount is uh, 10 million uh, generally, but um, is calculated um, based on average monthly payroll. So it's essentially 250% of average monthly payroll. Um, again, there are kind of numerous um, helpful um, qualifications uh, within that to help a business determine um, the uh, appropriate size of the loan. Um, the, um, in terms of allowable uses, again, there's really trying to be broad applicability here. Um, so these loans can be used for anything from payroll costs to mortgage interest obligations, rent, utility, interest on other debts preceding that February 5th um, start of the covered loan period, healthcare benefits, et cetera. Um, the loans generally are, there's a 10-year uh, maturity schedule with an interest rate of no more than 4%. Um, and they have really tried to uh, be as, as kind of flexible as possible um, in terms of kind of requirements for borrowers. Um, you know, there are uh, the borrower and lender fees are waived, prepayment fees are waived, um, collateral and kind of that um, personal guarantee uh, requirements uh, that often exist for small business loans are, are waived as well. Um, there's even a payment deferral of at least six months um, uh, and up to a year. Um, there's also some provisions around um, loan forgiveness too. Um, so there, are, there is some, uh, a possibility for businesses to have part of these loans forgiven, um, and that is, that is tied um, proportionally to um, the amount of staff and payroll that they are able to keep on. Um, so really trying to strengthen that kind of relationship uh, and make sure that as many people remain employed as possible um, and having, having loan forgiveness tied to that. Um, this is a large new program. This is a, a, there's been $349 billion appropriated here. Um, so it's quite significant. Um, definitely, again, the, the bulk of the, um, uh, of the appropriations provided in this phase three, of uh, this phase three legislation. Um, EIG and our blog has called on um, already thinking about reauthorizing this and upping the, the total as we anticipate that um, this need will only continue um, and may uh, you know, uh, exceed the current appropriated amount as well. Um, 
So with that, um, Rachel, unless there's anything else uh, I'd like me to cover um, on the Paycheck Protection Program, and again, we can take questions at the at the end of the presentation as well. No, that's great, Katherine. We can we can talk about state and local response now. So, um, as the federal uh, at the federal level, we've seen the response, and uh, even more quickly, we've seen states and cities provide assistance uh, through both grants and uh, debt facilities to react to the need that they're seeing in their communities. And so we've been tracking that and wanted to provide a few really great resources that we've found um, for you as well. So Living Cities has uh, provided a really great compilation of the different ways in which cities are providing both relief as well as, um, you know, financial relief and also doing regulatory relief. Um, if you go to their website, I know you guys can't click on the hyperlink here, but it's pretty front and center on their website, and that goes for all of uh, the following resources. Um, Council for Development Finance Agencies, um, they are tracking state actions. National League of Cities is also uh, tracking actions. They have a general COVID-19 action tracker. And then Duke Case uh, School of Management has a new application that is showing at a global level, actually, um, all support, which has been created specifically for entrepreneurs, and it's totaling about $14.5 billion in capital. So I um, wanted everyone to know that those resources are being tracked and are available for you if you're interested in taking a look. Um, one of the really interesting nexuses that we're seeing is that a lot of the same folks that have been on point for implementing opportunity zone strategies, so the economic development agencies and organizations across the nation are now being charged to enact these sort of preventative measures in order to shore up their local economies. And what we've seen as sort of an early win around opportunity zones is that in places where local leadership has really uh, been proactive and has taken the reins. We've seen enhanced collaboration amongst even state agencies um, amongst themselves, as well as with other cities within the state. Um, and we've seen enhanced collaboration at the local level as well uh, amongst organizations. We've also seen the formation of cross-sector partnerships where groups that hadn't previously been at the table with each other before or even in the same room are now working together as well as expansion of networks. So um, groups that didn't have access to certain investor networks are now in discussions with them. And so all of this we think has created the foundation for um, uh, potential action for uh, response to whatever needs are going to be uh, addressed in the forthcoming months and years ahead as we all look to help struggling economies recover from the economic shock that we're experiencing right now. And just as some examples of uh, different ways in which these opportunities and leaders are now putting out assistance to the community, Invest Atlanta has provided a business continuity fund, uh, which is a debt facility where they're offering loans at 0% with deferred payments and the chief opportunity zone officer for the city of Atlanta sits at at best Atlanta. Uh, very similarly, in Washington, D.C., the Deputy Mayor's Office of Planning and Economic Development has a small business micro-grant program. So this is a grant and not a loan. Um, and uh, that's available for small businesses, nonprofits, as well as uh, consultants, so folks that are, that are entrepreneurs or, or freelancers. And uh, Opportunity Alabama, which we'll talk about later on during the presentation, uh, they are aligned with the state and helping to do outreach uh, for whatever actions that the state moves forward in taking to help provide assistance to their affected families and small businesses. And from here, I'll turn it over to Lindsay Wallace at Main Street to talk about the different ways in which they are both tracking and providing resources uh, in response to COVID-19 and the economic shock we find ourselves in. Thank you. Um, hey, everybody. This is Lindsay Wallace with Main Street America. I wanted to echo um, Catherine and Rachel's sentiments. We're thrilled to be um, co-presenting this webinar today. It's really important that EIG is connected with our network. They're really the experts in, in opportunity zones. And as you can see, even just with the beginning of the slides, really have 
their finger on the pulse of a lot of things that are really important in terms of alternative financing and new forms of investment on Main Street. So just thrilled to have them here. Um, I'm just going to take just a couple minutes. So um, really the, the stars of the show need to be EIG on this, but I'll be here, of course, and, and at the Q&A as well. But um, as Rachel mentioned, we are at uh, Main Street America collecting and sharing information and resources and tools, et cetera, as they come in for COVID-19. We've created a few things, but also are um, basically trying to create or have created a clearinghouse at that link that you see down at the bottom of the right hand page there. We have uh, a webinar, a set of webinars, one we did last week that is recorded and one that's presenting tomorrow and we're going to continuously grow this page. There's also direct links to different funding sources and we'll continue to populate it. So I just want you to know, like if you have a resource that you're not seeing on this page, we wanna hear about it. So please feel free to share it with us, but just know that we're, we're working to, to populate this and keep it updated. Um, and this is a great example. I just wanted to show you. Oh, no, that's great. Yeah, that next slide is perfect. Thank you. Um, that was perfect timing. Uh, so one of the things that we're trying to do uh, as a part of this homepage is to have things that are easily shareable as well. So this is just an example of you know spending local safely or support local safely. So some ideas on um, to support small business. We also have a survey that went out on Friday that we would love it if you could share with your small businesses. We're trying to track what's happening. We're trying to track these effects. Uh, and actually, since um, we sent it out on Friday, I think we've had over 700 responses already, which is which is really incredible. And you know, thank you for all of your help in in getting that out. Um, we intend to use that data. I mean, obviously, everything will be um, anonymized. Nobody's information will be shared. But the the um, responses that we get from that will really help us advocate and help us spread the word about what's going on out there um, in our communities. So thank you for, for, help, for your help on that. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so for anybody on the phone, I just wanted to give you a quick uh, primer on who Main Street America is, if you aren't already familiar. I know we had a big response to this webinar, so I just want to make sure we're connecting with everybody uh, just in case. So Main Street America, we are a national network of uh, it's about 1,800, 1,600 uh, local organizations in 45 state, city, and county level Main Street coordinating programs. I'm seeing a lot of you guys on the phone today, so thanks for joining. Um, our programs in Main Street in general, the Main Street approach is really focused on supporting the revitalization of downtowns, mid-sized communities and neighborhood commercial districts and big cities. So we're really all about small businesses and uh, comprehensive approaches to sustainable economic development. <coughs> so we're really focused on supporting local leaders and residents um, with a practical framework to make that happen. So uh, opportunity zones and um, certainly support through this COVID-19 crisis are uh, really front and center in our work. Next slide, please. And you know, why Main Streets and Opportunity Zones? Um, you're here, so I think you probably see that connection, but um, you know, we really see Opportunity Zones as a really exciting financing option, specifically in these traditionally disinvested places. Um, you know, in kind of a specific focus, really these new opportunities for building rehabilitations and adaptive use. Many of you who have worked with older and historic buildings know that bricks and mortar funding can be really hard to find. So Opportunity Zones really afford this opportunity to offer new, new types of financing, new um, opportunities for different kinds of investors to plug into that Main Street economic development. Um, about 48% of our designated Main Street communities are located within Opportunity Zones. So there's a really good um, you know, cross section there, really good opportunity. Uh, there's the option for these multi-layered capital stacks. Again, many of you who have worked in older and historic um, commercial districts know that historic tax credits, new market tax credits, low-income housing tax credits are crucial in terms of getting development projects done. And so with opportunity zones, obviously, there's some pretty exciting opportunities to kind of layer those together. And also, of course, these new forms of investment uh, really help contribute to that long-term economic impact that's so crucial to our work. 
Um, one other thing I wanted to point out, so uh, as many of you know, uh, Main Street America, we are a subsidiary of the National Trust for Historic Preservation, and one of our partner subsidiaries, which is the National Trust Community Investment Corporation, um, they've long been involved in doing these kind of multi-layered capital stack projects, and um, they just released a, uh, a kind of resource page as well, looking at COVID-19 resources too. So if you aren't, aren't able to find that on their homepage, let me know, but it, it was just released. Um, but you know, they're, they're really plugged in and they also have a Main Street Fund. So I wanted to point that out as we're on the call here, but great partner, they do great work. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, you know, as, as we've seen opportunities opportunity zones grow and you know, kind of being connected to different partners and understanding the, the program in general, we've also done some specific, some specific opportunity zone work, particularly in this program called Opportunity Appalachia, which is a program that's run by Appalach Appalachian Community Capital, funded by the Appalachian Regional Commission Power Grant. Uh, it's focused in Ohio, Virginia, and West Virginia, and we're a program partner in that program uh, on their steering committee in which they're, they are funding technical assistance in 20 communities in those three states, really focused on building out strong prospectus, strong programs that will interest investors who uh, we will be working together to identify uh, later down the road. But some of the technical assistance that we're offering through this program, if you could go to the next slide, please. Oh, next slide. Yeah, thank you. Um, is really focused on that uh, economic vitality and design points in organization as well. Uh, those of you who are familiar with us know that we do have a whole field service team. I'm part of that team that offers technical assistance that's meant to be adapted to community, specific community needs. So we offer one on one coaching, tailored webinars, and you know, in person and community engagement. And specifically for opportunity zones, we're seeing big opportunities with TA in focusing on buildings, like historic preservation, building assessments and inventories, energy efficiency, uh, and streetscapes, trailer and development as they kind of connect to the larger projects. And then, then economic vitality, specifically some of the stuff we're doing in Opportunity Appalachia, uh, looking at market analysis, which many of you know is one of our major tech service offerings anyway, um, looking at demand assessments for for buildings downtown, vacant spaces, et cetera, connecting those with real estate developers and of course, feasibility studies. So just wanted to give you a, a sense of the kinds of things that we're doing in plugging into Opportunity Zone projects. If you go next slide, please. Uh, and since right now it's really important that we see some faces, I wanted to just share this slide with you of our, our field services team. Our staff has about 20 people now, which is which is great, but this is our specifically our field services team. So we're all kinds of doing all kinds of TA around this um, and, and excited to be doing so. So I will turn it back over to EIG. Thank you guys for giving me a couple couple minutes here. Great, sorry, that's, that's my cue. Um, all right, uh, this is Catherine again from EIG. Thank you so much um, for that. Um, so just uh, turning kind of to opportunity zones more specifically um, and some key updates here. Um, so first, that the, the final regulations um, were delivered in December of 2019 um, and went into effect, um, I believe on March 13th. Um, so we finally have clear rules of the road um, for um, a variety of the issues in terms of, you know, operating an opportunity fund, um, you know, putting investments into those funds, and then deploying that capital um, into, uh, you know, qualifying projects um, and businesses across the country. Um, this, uh, of course, provides clarity for investors and the fund managers, but it's really important, uh, it provides very important uh, clarity as well for, for communities um, to better understand how this may be able to fit um, into their economic development uh, plans um, and, and how opportunity zones could be helpful in advancing uh, some of those goals. Um, specifically, um, I wanted to talk uh, or point out a few uh, aspects that may be particularly helpful um, and notable for uh, for communities. Um, and they're listed here. 
Um, but essentially, the regulations, uh, a real key theme throughout the regulations, um, again, that were released at the end of last year, uh, was providing additional flexibility. And they um, provided particular flexibility for communities and for property owned by local governments. Um, and so there are some more favorable leasing and vacancy rules, for example, um, for tribal, state, and local government property, um, essentially just adding a bit more flexibility there um, for uh, you know, state and local government to either lease their property or um, to qualify vacant property as original use and therefore um, not be required to meet the substantial improvement test, um, which uh, would require essentially a, a doubling of basis or, you know, 100% investment of the, the value um, of the building, um, as an example. Um, and so there's just more kind of favorable rules that have been provided um, for property owned by uh, a government entity. Um, additionally, there's been some flexibility kind of uh, provided writ large for vacant property, um, lowering the kind of time frame required um, for a property to be vacant in order to qualify for original use and, and get that same benefit that I just mentioned. Um, so again, we hope that this will uh, this will prompt the um, a real kind of look at um, assets that are on the books um, on for many state and local governments. Um, you know what what do they already have under their control, um, and um, and how can they um, be really strategic about um, you know either uh, you know kind of selling those sites or um, you know leasing those those properties um, and putting some favor you know putting some important terms around that um, that again are helpful to meeting community goals. Um, so you know this is certainly in line with the spirit of the incentive, um, which is very much to kind of bring um, vacant or underutilized kind of property or investments um, back online um, and really putting them to uh, you know economic use and in a way that creates new opportunities for residents of these communities. Um, what's particularly uh, potentially particularly uh, important uh, in the crisis that we currently find ourselves in. Um, there, they also provided for uh, an extra 24 month working capital safe harbor on top of the 31 month ca working capital safe harbor they provide for qualifying businesses um, if those businesses are in a de federally declared disaster area. Now we're still trying to get some clarification um, on how this aligns with the national declared emergency um, that uh, was you know, put into place earlier this month um, uh, after, you know, in, um, in response to the, the COVID health, public health crisis. Um, so we are um, in the middle of, you know, requesting some clarity from Treasury um, on how that just um, how those how that flexible fle that flexibility rather um, may apply um, across the entire country, um, you know, to OZ investments and projects. Um, uh, that may be impacted here. Um, another significant um, element was the uh, inclusion of brownfield remediation, both land and buildings, um, to be able to be treated as original use. Um, again, uh, you know, uh, kind of circumventing or, or um, not having to meet some of that substantial, that kind of um, high threshold for substantial improvement, but rather um, being able to, again, bring brownfield, um, brownfields back online and back into to use um, and perhaps doing so um, more quickly and easily by being able to be qualified as original use. Um, so I think that's a really important one. We know that um, that was uh, the subject of many comments um, and comment letters throughout the process, um, and we were really uh, glad to see that brownfields were included. Um, as we've already started to see some successful projects um, come online um, that are in brownfields, um, you know, in, in particularly in some kind of rural um, or smaller communities across the country as well. Um, and then finally, we got some much needed clarity on the substantial improvement test, um, which uh, was very helpful. Um, and just providing some aggregation of certain buildings as well as assets generally, um, particularly for existing businesses that are interested in expanding um, in an opportunity zone. Um, we now have a bit more clarity um, that's necessary for those asset types um, to be able to hopefully um, you know, take uh, full advantage of the incentive and receive opportunity zone financing. Um, we have a whole webinar that we did, um, I believe, in January, um, shortly after the final regulations came out, 
um, that provided a bit more guidance on the final regulations. Um, hopefully that's a helpful resource for you all and we've linked that there as well. Um, I also see in the chat that um, many folks are asking if we are going to be um, circulating these slides and these resources and yes, we will be. So um, please stay tuned, but we will um, circulate the recording um, and have the, we'll be providing the links as well um, so that you can access all of this information and resources. All right, and with that, I believe I'm turning it over to Ken and Fikri, our Director of Research. Is that right, Rachel? That's correct. Ken? Great. All right, and Ken Hello. and I see you on unmuted here. There you are. <laughs> Okay. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for uh, joining us today and for the chance to talk. Uh, I hope you, you and yours are uh, doing well uh, through this time and glad that Opportunity Zones is at least bringing a subset of us together uh, virtually today. Um, so I'll jump right in and a little bit of the market context uh, for, uh, for you all. Um, now, Novogratik and Company, for those of you not familiar with them, uh, they're a, a boutique uh, consultancy and accounting firm an advisory firm out of San Francisco that specializes in new markets tax credits, historic preservation tax credits, uh, and the like, and now Opportunity Zones as well. And they have, uh, absent any uh, authoritative uh, uh, federal data collection effort uh, right now, uh, they have the most market intelligence of anyone that we know uh, on the fundraising side. And uh, this slide presents information from their survey of uh, opportunity funds that self-report to Novogratik uh, and estimating uh, how much money they have actually raised uh, in their opportunity funds. And you can see as of January 2020, uh, it had uh, exceeded seven and a half billion. So to put that into context, uh, each year the uh, typical new markets tax credit uh, federal allocation is 3.5 billion. So we've already, uh, OZs are already almost twi twice the size in terms of equity capital unlocked uh, than a new markets tax credit, uh, which means they are uh, really, you know, they, they are significant now in the community and economic development landscape uh, and in a lot of the work that you do. Uh, it should be noted that uh, this only represents a fraction of the market too. This, these are just funds that are raising money and self-reporting to this directory. So uh, uh, we and they estimate that the true size of the market right now may be two or three times this. Uh, you know, it's too soon to tell what impact the current economic public health crisis is having on the uh, fundraising market. Uh, but, you know, there were a lot of capital gains realized uh, as people liquidated their uh, uh, their stocks and other investments uh, over the past couple of weeks. So it could be a, a much larger set of dollars, you know, heading into uh, this asset class that's really designed to invest uh, in the long term development of places. Uh, and, you know, this is only uh, capturing equity stakes in uh, larger projects, right? Uh, there will be debt financing that complements this, uh, some grants and uh, some other public financing, uh, as, as well as debt financing. So the leverage ratio here uh, may, be, uh, may be high as well. Uh, this reflects fundraising that uh, is both national and local in scope. So, uh, you know, we've, uh, looking at the landscape of opportunity funds, uh, you see a large number that are, of course, trying to invest nationally, but then you see about uh, equally as large a number that focused on particular regions or uh, parts of the country uh, and are adopting a much more local focus. Uh, so it's a, kind of an interesting mix here, and I encourage you to dig into this resource if you want to get a little more flavor for the market. Uh, the survey also shows that investments directly into operating businesses uh, have been slow to take off, given that they were practically uh, not really even possible until the regulations were finalized in December of last year. Uh, but it's also one of the fastest growing market segments that so it'll be interesting to watch over the course of the next year, kind of how uh, the two asset classes, you know, uh, uh, real estate and, and operating businesses of balance in the OZ marketplace. And uh, next slide, Catherine. Thanks. So we've been uh, trying to collect our own uh, market intelligence by really mining just news articles and press releases and uh, consolidating in one place uh, all the good stories that we see emerging in Opportunity Zones across the country. So I encourage you to check out our uh, EIG's Opportunity Zones activity map. Uh, it's a, it'll be hyperlinked to here in the slides. And here we uh, capture all the investments, uh, opportunity funds and local initiatives and nonprofit sector activities uh, that 
are really new and noteworthy and you know, worthy of emulation by others in the field trying to understand what they can do to help Opportunity Zones deliver economic development impact for their communities. So it's, it's a real gallery of, I think, the best and the brightest of what OZs has to offer right now. Uh, it has a couple hundred different pins and uh, it shows also uh, that you know, all parts of the country right now are uh, benefiting from Opportunity Zones and finding, finding new avenues uh, to deploy this capital. So I think, especially if you're wondering, like, hey, how can my community engage? Or, hey, I haven't really heard of any rural places uh, getting money. Isn't this just an urban policy? Uh, you can visit this tool uh, with lots of filters by geography, by themes of investments, et cetera, and see you know, what examples are taking root uh, across the country and, and hopefully find some inspiration through it too. Uh, next slide. Now this uh, just pulls a couple examples uh, of which you can find on uh, on the map uh, that shows you the flavor of the types of places that are uh, seeing OZ investments and uh, what it's going towards. So you see uh, really all in rural and small uh, areas, we have a couple of great examples of business startup and expansion investments in a uh, co-working software providing company in uh, the western slope of Colorado, in a uh, mental health uh, online analytics firm in rural Vermont, uh, in a new kind of vertical farming startup that's occupying old industrial sites along the Monongahela River in Braddock, Pennsylvania. Uh, it's really interesting applications uh, of a whole bunch of different um, uh, possible investment scenarios. We also see this investing you know, into business infrastructure in you know, creating a new processing facility for a seafood uh, company in Maine that's trying to diversify after uh, in the trade war, its markets got uh, closed to China, has to find new outlets for its, its food. So OZs were there to help, uh, help it diversify. Uh, and also in uh, East Chicago, Indiana, the giant brownfield site is being converted into a new logistics center uh, with, with OZ Capital. Uh, on the housing front, uh, Rachel will go into a number of great investments here, uh, but we see everything from affordable to market rate to senior uh, to multifamily to increasingly some single family housing uh, in a range of markets. Uh, in the uh, recreational tourism and Main Street's economy, I think these can kind of be, be uh, lumped together. Uh, we're seeing specialty funds pop up. Uh, we're seeing kind of niche tourism destinations, be they uh, uh, here, this uh, under the stars farm is a lavender farm in, in Virginia. Uh, there are uh, campsites in Colorado and elsewhere uh, that are all uh, trying to diversify the rural economy into tourism with the help of opportunity zones. And then there's, there's a really fantastic story out of uh, Brookville, Indiana, which is a small town of about 3,000, halfway between Indianapolis and Columbus, or yeah, Indianapolis and Cincinnati, sorry, uh, where a local family uh, owned a business, uh, sold it, and wanted to reinvest the proceeds in their community and did so uh, by bringing housing, a new commercial space, a grocery facility, I believe, pharmacy facilities, some health offices uh, to what was a downtrodden Main Street in uh, uh, the town of Brookville. Uh, in a mid-sized city, uh, Opportunity Zones Capital is helping uh, re reuse a uh, really prized historical building in, called the Port of Dubuque uh, in a prime uh, redevelopment area in partnership with the, uh, with the city there. Uh, and then in Brigham City, Utah, uh, another historic uh, anchor of Main Street, the Union Block building is being converted into community spaces with the thanks, uh, thanks to uh, OZ Capital. And uh, finally, we're seeing uh, a number of uh, EDS and MEDS anchor institutions uh, find their applications in the Opportunity Zone universe. Be they you know, Stillman College, which is a historically black college and university in Tuscaloosa, uh, working with an OZ investor to create a uh, teaching hotel uh, off the campus, uh, to Metro Health in Cleveland, a large hospital complex that's investing directly into quality affordable housing to try to influence the uh, social determinants of health there for uh, uh, its uh, neighbors uh, that end up also utilizing its services. Uh, so uh, as, as you can see, it's a real variety here. Uh, we see this as uh, kind of intentional and, and, and uh, expected for us, but I think unexpected for many others uh, that had difficulty grappling initially with the open-endedness of the OZ incentive. Uh, usually, uh, you know, federal programs are very prescriptive, 
Uh, opportunity zones was by design meant to really be a tool, a provision of the tax code that could be deployed flexibly um, by private sector actors, uh, often in concert and coordination with uh, local partners, you know, on main streets and on the ground throughout the country, but in a way that really led to the kind of extreme tailoring uh, and diversity of investments that we're seeing here. So with that, I'll, I'll kick it over to, I believe, back to Rachel uh, for what comes next. Yeah, thanks, Kenan. And so as we're gathering this information about projects happening throughout the nation, as well as we've been convening uh, local intermediaries, so both folks working at the state level as well as in communities to build out their opportunities and ecosystems. So to uh, ensure that investors are taking a look at their community, that the community is aligned around one strategy and that they are tracking and measuring the impact of what those investments have for their communities. We've been gathering a lot of intel, gathering a lot of data. And so for the remainder of the slides that I'm gonna share, uh, we are showing some different community strategies uh, throughout the nation, as well as some investment profiles that we have listed on our website where we take a deep dive into specific projects, uh, affordable housing, uh, an investment into a business, and we'll be continuing to put those online where we really break down um, you know, the nature of the investment and um, and we want to start here with Opportunity CLE, which is in Cleveland. And um, this is what I'm showing you here are the different work streams that Opportunity CLE is engaged in. And again, every community is going to have uh, different priorities based on their needs, as well as the capacity of the partners involved in their implementation strategy and, and plan. And so there in Cleveland, you see the implementation partners listed below. It's a mix of those public sector and private sector partners, and um, they're engaged in marketing activities. They are looking to create a local fund, so an opportunity fund. Uh, they are very much activating a investment pipeline, so working with local developers as well as uh, businesses and entrepreneurs to identify investable assets, quote unquote investable assets, and then get those listed onto an online platform. Um, Opportunity CLE is also engaged in, in policy and advocacy, which may or may not be a good fit for your community, um, but, but they are very much see that as an important plank within their broader strategy. Um, they are providing education and technical assistance uh, to the community, and uh, very importantly, they have a social impact framework through which they are both assessing projects at the front end, as well as through which they'll be monitoring the impact of those projects. And we are seeing a lot of great activity coming out of Cleveland. Uh, Ken had mentioned earlier the Metro Health uh, investment it to revitalize their uh, neighborhoods surrounding their hospital campus. Uh, another great project that we want to share, I think I want to go to the next slide. Is the TAPIN. Um, so we have on our website uh, investment profile for the TAPIN. And this is a project that was uh, financed through a number of different sources and we have those listed here for you but also on the project profile and really one of the big questions we always get is what does the capital stack look like how is the capital phased into the project and the real answer is that it just depends it depends on where the gap for financing is needed and uh, at what point during the project is it realized and so here you can see that um, the Opportunity Zone capital came to the tap-in uh, through multiple partners. So through both the developer, which is a local developer in Cleveland called Sustainable Community Associates, as well as another local partner. And then PNC Bank also provided Opportunity Zone equity. Uh, PNC Bank provided the construction loan on this project and the city of Cleveland provided debt to the project as well. So. Uh, all of the stacks that I've been seeing for Opportunity Zone projects have been mixed stacks and uh, Opportunity Zone financing can be a portion as large as this, or we've seen uh, even smaller portions. One of the affordable housing profiles that we have online as well 
was 800,000. So um, it really varies, but the Tabin, this project will, uh, it's market rate uh, rental property, but it's mixed use. So on the first floor, it has a uh, new space for a local entrepreneur who's a baker to open his business. And by doing that, he's creating 17 jobs and what they were able to do with the developers, Sustainable Community Associates, is through the Opportunity Zone tax benefit, even though it's a benefit to investors, because of the way that this specific deal was structured, uh, investors took what looks more like a concessionary rate of return on the Opportunity Zone equity. And uh, that relief in the capital stack allowed Sustainable Community Associates to pass that benefit through to renters in the form of reduced rents. And so while it was originally modeled as market rate apartments only, now they have um, also provided workforce affordable. So this is just one example and uh, would love folks to read more about that uh, on our website. We have a number of affordable housing projects profiled on our website, but that is the one that we've chosen to share with you from Cleveland. And in addition to that, we did a webinar in December uh, where the developer came on, talked more about the tap and So again, you can take a look in our blog archives where all of our webinars are stored to uh, learn more about that and the other affordable housing deals that are profiled. Next slide. Uh, and then a second community that we wanted to feature is Montrose, Colorado. Uh, Montrose is a community of 19,000. They are doing a lot of things right. And if you go to their website, you can see how they're marketing their opportunity zones. They have a perspective, they have a video. Um, but what I also found really interesting about how Montrose is positioning their value proposition to folks looking to make investments is by very explicitly showing the different business incentives for going to the city of Montrose. And so you can see how the incentive stack or uh, the multi-layered uh, incentive opportunities here really are uh, depicted in a way that's, that I think is attractive to both businesses as well as investors who are looking to invest in businesses. And um, they've had a lot of really great success in the city of Montrose and uh, their point of contact, Chelsea Rossi, is uh, doing really great things there. And um, one of the businesses that the city invested in early, um, by the way, providing support to, uh, to provide tenant fit out for this company called Proximity along their local main street. This was years ago prior to Opportunity Zones, but they invested early in this company because they saw the, the potential of this company. Um, Proximity has then gone on to secure a number of different uh, investors through Opportunity Zones. So um, we did a profile on that company as well. And if you want to go to the next slide. Uh, we're sharing with you here the investment profile or, or snapshots from it uh, for Proximity. Uh, Center on Rural Innovation, they've created a fund um, that their first investment was made in proximity. And right now proximity is, is in the middle of an equity raise, which they think is gonna help them expand to 1500 locations. And what proximity does is they are a co-working um, uh, facilitator and a, a space that allows co-working spaces to gain operational efficiencies. And really the effort is to allow more entrepreneurs and small businesses to flourish uh, outside of major metro markets. And so very, very important work that they're doing. And um, as you can see from their capital raise, uh, the recent numbers in January was that half of the capital that they've been able to secure has been from Opportunity Zone investors and the other half has just been from traditional uh, equity. And within the slice of OZ equity raised, there have been three different investors. So a lot of times when folks are thinking about investments into business, they're thinking that opportunities and financing is going to be the only source of capital. 
uh, into those businesses. And so we just wanted to provide an illustration of an example where it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. It could be half of a capital raise. And even within that half of the capital raise, multiple investors can be engaged uh, through, through supporting it. Next slide. This is another community strategy we wanted to highlight. Uh, this is out of the state of Indiana. And very early on, uh, there were two community development financial institutions, so LISC and Sinair, who really kind of ran with this idea of creating a statewide consortium of key stakeholder groups. So uh, what we're seeing now in Indiana is this uh, consortium called the Opportunity Investment Consortium of Indiana. And it's comprised of investors, uh, education and resource partners, so folks that are really within the state agencies um, and, and ensuring that they are aligned to help align resources, tax incentives, as well as help them build pipeline of investments. And then the third bucket, which I think is really important, is this professional service members. So your legal, your, your legal firms, your accounting firms, uh, wealth management, so so your gatekeepers, the folks that are advising investors on uh, whether or not these are good investments to make, as well as who's going to be uh, keeping track of compliance on the back end. So um, they've had a lot of success. They've established a portal um, through which investments can be listed and uh, investors can get in contact with potential project sponsors and businesses interested in making those investments. It helps to elevate projects and create transparency. And this group uh, frequently meets to discuss how things are progressing and new uh, deal opportunities and ways in which they can continue to build out their offerings and their local collaboration. So again, I think this is a really great example of, uh, of how Opportunity Zones has catalyzed um, enhanced collaboration and uh, folks working together who otherwise wouldn't be working together in order to connect capital to communities that that may not otherwise be elevated on on such a level. Next slide. And one of the early wins that we're seeing in Indiana, and kind of mentioned it earlier, is this example of Brookville, Indiana. So again, a town of 3,000, smaller town where family uh, went ahead and invested in multiple projects, including an investment to save the local newspaper um, and encouraged others to do the same. And LISC did a case study on, on those efforts. And so we've linked it there. And again, as Catherine mentioned, we'll provide the slide deck afterwards so folks can get to those links. And then another community strategy we wanted to share is the work being done in the state of Alabama through Opportunity Alabama. And uh, I think folks may be familiar with Opportunity Alabama, um, but when people talk about opportunities and leadership and, and looking towards groups that, that are really on the forefront of, of innovation, Opportunity Alabama is frequently mentioned. Um, they have been able to create a pipeline of about $1 billion in opportunities and investments throughout the state and have been able to coordinate a lot of community development efforts uh, for the state of Alabama. They have uh, Alabama last year updated its Incentive Modernization Act to include opportunity zones. And I think a lot of that was through the really great advocacy and work that Opportunity Alabama did. And um, one of the questions we often get as well is how are a lot of these great community initiatives connecting to capital? You know, once we have the perspectives, once we have identified our projects, how are we connecting to investors or talking with investors? And so you know, I recommend folks take a look at what Opportunity Alabama is doing, go to their website, but we wanted to provide a snapshot of their offerings to investors. So when you click on their for investors tab on their website, this is what it shares. So 
they're offering services to investors to help them understand the landscape, help them navigate uh, their communities, which is really helpful, especially for outside investors. Um, and it provides an easier glide path for them to deploy capital. Very similarly, facilitating connections. So if an investor wants to make an investment in Alabama, but doesn't know where to start, uh, they can work through Opportunity Alabama to do that. Um, and then also Opportunity Alabama, because they are sort of the, the group through which these investors may go through, they have the opportunity to then guide investment towards highly impactful projects. And, you know, some investors may be thinking about that on the outset, some may not, but having an intermediary there to help guide investors and have those conversations with them um, I think only strengthens outcomes on the back end. And one of the things that Opportunity Alabama has done with their investors is say, if you come through us and work with us, um, then both investors and developers and businesses that, that are our partners and have received a benefit from um, the net, from the connections we're facil facilitating uh, are also agreeing to provide some level of reporting on the back end around impact and um, and outputs as far as the projects that are happening. So as Ken had mentioned, you know, absent any federal requirements for reporting and data, we are seeing a lot of local initiatives come up with really smart ways to help track and monitor the activity that is happening in their communities. And I will say that um, you know, this work has resulted in investments that probably otherwise wouldn't have gotten to communities. So we always talk about Heflin, Alabama, where uh, the vacant high school is now being converted to uh, assisted living facility. Um, the American Life Building, which is in Birmingham, was vacant for over three decades. Uh, it will become workforce housing, 155 apartments. Um, and they entered into an agreement with a local nonprofit to set aside a number of those apartments, uh, which will be provided at zero dollars rent for, I think, between 10 to 15 years. And so there's definitely a community benefit associated with that project. Um, and another project that Opportunity Alabama was very much at the table in, in helping to facilitate and partner on is the one that Ken had mentioned earlier with Stillman College in, in Tuscaloosa. And so I think it's just really important as we talk about these different community strategies that whether it's a chief opportunity zone officer in a city or um, some larger uh, intermediary that is facilitating regional or statewide connections, that there is at least a point of contact for investors and um, interested parties, so developers and businesses looking to receive opportunities and investment to, um, to coalesce around because uh, without that, the space looks a little fragmented and the wayfinding is difficult. And where we have seen these organized efforts, we've seen an outsized result around the investment that's been attracted to benefit local priorities and needs. Next slide. And then another community strategy uh, that we want to highlight very quickly and um, also want to point to a webinar that we did with the Erie Downtown Development Corporation is just the general uh, efforts that are happening in Erie, Pennsylvania. And so again, Erie, Pennsylvania, very similar to the other communities we mentioned, started uh, pretty early in the Opportunity Zones process and they established what they're calling the flagship opportunity zone, which is uh, basically branding for their eight opportunity zones in Erie. And they've been able to secure a $10 million fund. So they attracted a national investor uh, to come in JV with their local Erie Innovation District uh, to create a $10 million fund that is specifically oriented towards providing capital for local cybersecurity and information technology startups. So the question around, is this money actually 
getting to operating businesses and entrepreneurs. Um, there is an example in Erie where this $10 million fund has been created. And the JV, the partnership between the national and local organizations, I think is another um, best practice to point out because as national capital is looking to deploy in markets where it may not have good uh, market intelligence or, or a footprint, so it doesn't have those insights that they necessarily need to understand where the investments are or, um, or even manage that, that asset, manage that investment. Um, working with a local partner who, who understands you know, how to get things done, how to process things, who the players are, and, um, and where, where the investments may lie is, is really, I think, a, a good strategy to follow. So um, that, is, that is something that I just wanted to point out to folks. And then for real estate investments, that is really being led by the Erie Downtown Development Corporation. And they're embarking on a number of really ambitious projects. But one of the things that they've said is that uh, OZ Equity coming into play has accelerated their downtown redevelopment timeline. So something that they had slated for a 25 year redevelopment has now been compressed into five years uh, because they were able to get a source of equity to come in to uh, help finance these projects. And really, you know, one of the things that I think is, is a key ingredient to this acceleration, but also as folks are looking to how to structure financing around OZ Capital, um, is Erie has this equity fund that um, it's called equity fund, but really it's, it's uh, debt, but um, they have what I would describe as an acquisition fund that is uh, lending capital provided at really preferable terms. And so they can use that fund to go and acquire property um, and then hold that property while they then raise OZ capital to come and take out that debt. And then as soon as they're ready to, to activate the OZ capital, they're ready to do that. So they're able to time it in a way as, as such that, that they have preferable terms on that lending and the OZ capital can come in when it's ready to. So you're not dealing with the time restrictions associated with, um, with having to, to wait that out that, with the compliance issues on the OZ funding. Next slide. And I think this is the final slide for me, and it was an important one for us to include because this is number one, a really great project. It's in Newark, New Jersey, and uh, it also received financing from NTCIC. And um, the project's called Newark Arts Commons, and it is the rehabilitation of a very, very large uh, property. So it's the vacant St. Michael's Hospital. Um, it has been vacant for quite a while and the reuse of it is going to be a center for arts education and what they're calling creative co-living. So um, what that means in practical terms is uh, artist apartments. And the first two floors, I believe, will include affordable office space for nonprofits and arts organizations. And uh, through those two first floors, um, they'll be able to serve about 500 low and moderate income kids each year uh, within Newark. And um, you can see it's supported by the Urban Henderson Main Street Revitalization Fund. NTCIC uh, came through with 2 million new market tax credit financing, as well as additional historic tax credits. So those are federally historic tax credits. Um, another question we often get is, you know, whether OZ can be paired with new market tax credits. Uh, clearly you can see that it has, and it has been done successfully. And uh, I think overall the total project was 23 million OZ financing played a role of uh, 11 million in the total capital stack. So um, I think there's some additional uh, historic tax credits that were added to that as well as some, some debt, but uh, 
those are just some examples of the different investments that are happening as well as the ways in which communities are responding to opportunity zones and structuring around um, the different needs around local capacity as well as marketing to investors to really elevate their local needs uh, and ensure that the investment that is coming in is um, tracked and monitored for impact. And with that, Lindsay, I think I'll turn it back over to you. Okay, thanks, Rachel. Um, thank you for those great examples. I think, you know, in just sort of thinking about all of all of those examples, it's, it's really important in, in the Main Street Network to take away that opportunity zones and the financing they can bring can work in all kinds of situations, different kinds of projects in different places. So, you know, I think Rachel made the point earlier on that a lot of times people think of OZ funding being um, primarily used in bigger cities, which, you know, there's need and that's is good where the uptake is anywhere, but we're seeing more and more rural examples. So I appreciate the balance of those to, to show because our network obviously is um, full of big city um, districts and rural districts across the country. So important to see that variety that we're seeing more and more. So really just the, the kind of overall key takeaways, just want the network to, to make sure that you understand that you know, opportunity zones really offer these unique opportunities that are, um, you know, I think particularly valuable in Main Street communities that have been tr traditionally disinvested. So just a, a good opportunity for that. Um, again, the opportunity for layering financing, which you've seen some really good examples of that. Um, especially, you know, if you're undertaking any kind of these, you know, tax credit projects can be somewhat complicated. And so when you have an opportunity to layer them to really maximize that investment, um, you know, that's a really important opportunity to have. Um, you know, the other piece that we had talked about with EIG, they've mentioned in this webinar is that, you know, obviously most of us are concerned right now with the immediate recovery efforts needed in the COVID-19 pandemic and this situation. And that's top of mind for most folks, but one of the things we want to make sure to do as the national organization and with our you know, state partners and local partners is start to think about next steps planning for Main Street recovery and opportunity zones and other kinds of uh, new opportunities for financing is an, are important to be thinking about um, as we pivot eventually to these next steps investing. Um, you know, the other piece, just as EIG has demonstrated here, is that with opportunity zones, we're seeing a continuously growing set of resources. So examples from across the country, big cities, small, small towns. Um, the EIG map that Rachel showed is really cool, um, and I would highly recommend just spending some time looking at the different projects because, um, you know, you see really, you know, things that are running the gamut. And the more and more examples we get, the more we can see how these things apply. Um, and then, of course, the local and state incentives, education and tools. I mean, the, the programs that Rachel pointed out at the beginning of the program here are really exciting. I mean, you can see the sort of um, creative responses to these big issues and, and um, you know, especially this specific situation that's hitting us, the creative responses to these kinds of things. So the, the more we see of these different kinds of examples, the more we can share, uh, the more we can learn and, you know, hopefully apply in our own communities. I also wanted to just double down and make sure you understand that, you know, Main Street America is really committed to offering um, different resources, both on opportunity zones and, of course, with COVID-19, but we're continuously expanding our offerings with webinars, especially now, you know, doing some digital instruction. Our resource homepage, make sure to check that out and send us anything you think, you know, is worthy of um, having on the page. You know, we want to make sure we're sourcing across the country. Uh, we're offering some op education opportunities and best practices, so just keep your eye on that homepage. Um, you know, we, we hope to continuously populate it. And of course, with our technical assistance, we have, as I mentioned earlier, some services that specifically connect to the opportunity zone opportunities and projects and that sort of thing. Um, so if you're interested in any of that, you know, we're obviously happy to talk through it, but just know that we're, you know, we support you and um, hope that many of you will be able to, to take part in this, in this really cool opportunity. So I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks. Great. 
Thank you so much. Um, so just this last slide, um, we'll just go through really quickly um, just a few additional resources um, that DIG has recently released. Um, the a couple, of course, um, very uh, pertinent and relevant, um, you know, to the at least beginning of this conversation on uh, the economy and how it's impacted by COVID-19. Um, that includes uh, a link to the blog that we went through um, earlier in this presentation. Uh, regarding the Paycheck Protection Program as well. Um, we've also listed here some of the opportunity zones resources, including the activity map um, that Kenan presented on um, earlier in this presentation. Um, so again, we will be circulating uh, this recording afterward with links to all of these resources as well. Um, I believe, and then here's our contact information. Feel free to reach out to um, any of us. Um, and Lindsay, I hope I can speak for you as well saying that. Yeah, um, and great. Yeah, thank you. Um, and, uh, you know, happy to answer any um, more specific questions um, or questions at all that we're maybe not able to get to on this webinar, um, you know, and, and that offline way. So um, feel free to reach out um, about anything uh, pertaining to the topic of this, of this webinar. Um, I think with that, um, Rachel, uh, I'm going to go ahead and start the Q&A if that works for you. Um, and yep. Lindsay, are you able to join through the end of the presentation in case there are any directed toward your work? Yes, absolutely. I'm here. Yes. Thanks. Okay, great. Um, okay, so we've got quite a bit of um, uh, traction here on the, on the chat function, um, so bear with me here as I am going through and finding some of the um, uh, some of the questions, the earliest questions. Um, so in terms of uh, understanding how um, loan amounts and forgiveness will be calculated, um, again, I would encourage you to, uh, or sorry, for independent and self-employed business owners, so sort of um, starting at the beginning, so kind of backtracking to the, the very first slides here. Um, I encourage you to, to look at the blog that does have more details on um, the calculations, um, but I, I believe for, um, you know, independent or self-employed business owners with, without employees, um, you know, that is taken into account, um, you know, in the, um, and, you know, if you are, uh, you know, obviously if there's no, nobody on the, the payroll for the loan forgiveness piece, um, then, uh, you know, that you, of course, wouldn't be um, penalized um, there for uh, any kind of um, layoffs or furloughing, um, et cetera. Um, but again, we'll have more details there on how to exactly um, calculate some of your expenses, um, and that will help determine the, the appropriate loan amount as well. Um, there's another question, just a clarification, that this is part of the CARES Act. Um, so yes, the, sorry, the phase three legislation we were referring to is the CARES Act. Um, and this, um, this Paycheck Protection Program is part of that. Um, so, uh, yeah, that, that, that is, um, and it will be administered by the FBA. So just to clarify from a question there. Um, additionally, businesses that proactively let employees go so that they could receive unemployment, um, would they not be eligible for loan forgiveness? There actually is a provision in there um, that if you, if you did that, you will not be penalized um, if you rehire those employees. Um, before the end of the covered loan period, um, which is June 30th. Um, so there is a rehiring clause within that. Um, so uh, anyone who did have to do that and make those, those tough decisions early on um, would not be penalized um, for the loan forgiveness aspect of that. Um, okay, so I think um, moving on to, um, Sorry, I have I'm going through some of the issues with the slideshow. Apologies for that earlier on. Um, so, to I think a question that came up related to um, the, the opportunity zones regulations, and apologies, I didn't provide additional context for this initially. Um, what's the significance of original use is the question. Um, and so, every qualifying opportunity zone investment or, or project that receives investment. Um, must be either original to the zone, so it must the its first use has to be in the zone. Um, and so, again, in, in an attempt to create new economic activity in the zone and not just finance existing, um, you know, activity happening there. Um, so it either has to be original use, um, so building would have to be built or constructed, um, you know, uh, from scratch, 
um, or it has to be substantially improved. And so, um, you know, if a building already exists in the zone, um, it needs to be improved uh, by the threshold of essentially putting 100% of the value of the building um, back into it. Um, so it is a quite a high threshold. Um, but again, with the intention of um, providing and promoting additional economic activity or, you know, real improvement into the um, into the place. Um, so that's the that's the significance. Um, and that's how an, an, a project would have to qualify or show that they're qualified um, for, the rec uh, for receiving opportunities on financing. Um, all right. Um, have there been examples of investments in brownfield cleanups? So yes, there have been a couple um, uh, that are off the top of my head. I'm sure there's been more than that. Um, but uh, one that are a couple that stick out um, in, in my mind are one, the Yard 56 program in Baltimore um, that uh, was uh, also, I believe, a, um, well, no, I won't say it's a PNC deal because I'm actually not sure that's, that's true. Rachel can chime in. <laughs> um, but uh, essentially, it was a brownfield. It's located across um, the street from the Johns Hopkins Bayview campus um, in a uh, very distressed uh, part of that city. Um, and it has been remediated, um, and I believe that project is actually close to finished. Um, there's now a grocery store there. It's a mixed-use kind of retail development, um, bringing a lot of, um, you know, kind of necessary uh, um, attributes um, to that community, um, you know, including fast casual places. Like I said, a grocery store. I believe there's a gym as well. So um, that has all been remediated um, in part using opportunities on financing. Another uh, example is an East East Chicago, Indiana, um, and uh, taking a uh, former, I believe a former DuPont site, um, but either way, kind of a former former factory site, and developing that into a, uh, a, a distribution center. Um, so that, again, was also a brownfield development um, that has received uh, OZ financing in part, at least, to, um, to help advance that project. Yeah, in the year 56, that was actually a pretty substantial investment by Prudential. Um, and so, Sorry, yes. yeah, <laughs> no, and uh, PNC has done a lot of really great work. So, um, so they're always top of mind for us. But, <laughs> um, but uh, I just also want to point back to what Catherine mentioned earlier around some of the clarification and flexibility provided through the final round of regulations, where uh, we saw that that less investment would be required on brownfields, and that was a way of incenting additional activity to happen to remediate and um, and activate those sites. So hopefully more examples of those will come online very soon. Great. Um, and Rachel, maybe um, you can help uh, in answering some of these. So uh, one uh, question here is related to examples for truly smaller projects. Um, so examples of projects of perhaps a million dollars or less and, and how opportunities on financing may or may not be the kind of best approach there uh, and what we've seen kind of generally in the early days of the market thus far. Yeah, I would say that there's there's no one size fits all for opportunity zones uh, and opportunity zone financing. And that's kind of that was part of the policy design. And um, as far as efficiencies around making those types of investments, the question really is, you know, can you find an investor uh, who would want to do a $20,000 investment into a, you know, $50,000, $100,000 project or what have you into a smaller project or fully finance it themselves uh, through OZ financing? And um, with that, I would say, I would say, look at your local uh, wealth base. Like, look at look at the folks in your communities who, just like they did in Brookville, Indiana, who may have capital gains to invest and um, may not be aware of opportunity zones as a potential vehicle through which to do that, or may um, may have otherwise just invested it through another vehicle, uh, so invested it on on Wall Street as opposed to Main Street. Um, so if you're trying to move projects forward that are that are smaller, relatively smaller in dollar size, um, I think focusing on your local investors are is a really good strategy. Um, another strategy would be to look at the community development financial institutions who have created opportunity funds. And off the top of my head, uh, just because they're recent conversations I've had, are uh, 
a CDFI called Sinair, uh, so that begins with a C, and then also uh, Wood Forest CD or CEI, so Wood Forest CEI. Um, they've also created an opportunity fund, and oftentimes those uh, opportunity funds are making investments at smaller clips as well. And so um, those would be those would be my two recommendations. And Lindsay, I'll actually kick it over to you because I know that um, you guys are positioned to provide technical assistance to Opportunity Appalachia, and this may have come up as part of those early conversations. Um, it yeah, it did a bit, but honestly, like what we talked about, a lot of it you've covered. Um, one thing that I I will say that's pretty interesting in terms of the types of smaller projects that we're seeing. Uh, we're seeing all kinds. Uh, one thing that's popped up a lot in some of the smaller projects has been like hotel rehabilitations or rehabilitations of other buildings for um, you know, adaptively used as hotels, which it it seems like even now the the, the market is showing that those would be um, optimal projects, which are really interesting. We're also seeing some of these smaller projects um, around like industrial site revitalization, not necessarily brown sites, but like, you know, kind of industrial corridor uh, revitalization, whether it's adaptive use or um, continued use of the same industry. And those are kind of some of the smaller things we're seeing. But it's really running the gamut, which is, which is pretty cool. And we'll see, you know, once these actually get implemented to be able to share some of those examples. But Generally speaking, um, there's a nice variety. Great. A um, couple more questions that have come through. I think one um, that uh, I'll just kind of broaden out to generally say, you know, where do we feel like Opportunity Zones is headed um, with the um, stock market? Um, Sorry, uh, where do we think Opportunity Zones is headed um, kind of with the, the fluctuations in the stock market and just generally with the crisis um, and the kind of early observations and, and with the caveat that, yes, it's still quite early, um, you know, and so we're still sort of uh, kind of gathering some market intelligence here. Um, but, uh, you know, where, where we see Opportunity Zones or how do we see Opportunity Zones kind of playing a role here? Um, so, you know, the first thing that I'll kind of kick it off, but of course, um, Rachel and Lindsay, feel free to, to add your thoughts as well. Um, so we've done a, a, quite a bit of con um, conversing with some key stakeholders in, in the market and those who are either managing funds or tracking this information closely, um, the activity closely. And, um, you know, there, uh, there's been probably a lot of capital gains generated, um, at least in the earlier part of this month or, or last month um, as folks were uh, kind of watching this and, and selling off uh, stocks. And so we anticipate seeing in the next six months or so, um, you know, potentially a, a real trend line of um, understanding how investors are thinking about opportunity zones and, um, you know, if they are, are really utilizing the incentive, um, you know, uh, be, because of this new opportunity, I guess, that's um, fallen into, you know, that they've, um, the, or rather the, the realization of capital gains, I guess is a, is a better way of saying that. Um, you know, we, we think that there are, uh, or, you know, that many asset classes are, that we're already seeing investments into um, are kind of counter cyclical, for example, offer, um, affordable housing, um, assisted living facilities, things like that. Um, but there's also a kind of a real, I think, um, aim to more invest more socially, you know, and more socially impactful projects, um, maybe in light of this, um, this crisis and perhaps um, opportunity zones can be an important tool in, again, facilitating um, some of those more socially impactful projects um, in these, you know, hard hit communities, um, as well as facilitating a more equitable recovery. I think once the, this immediate crisis um, passes as well, um, this was a tool that did not exist in the wake of the Great Recession, um, you know, and uh, what we saw there was a really um, uneven recovery um, based, you know, in terms of place. Um, and so what we hope Opportunity Zones can be, um, this is where our kind of optimism kicks in, kicks in um, is a tool uh, for communities um, to facilitate a much more kind of equitable recovery, um, you know, again, in the future. Um, so that's uh, kind of what we'd say there. Um, again, maybe a little more, um, very much on the, the sort of optimistic side of things. And maybe Rachel, if you wanted to add any additional context on, um, you know, what we're hearing from others. 
um, in terms of investors and fund managers and such. Yeah, and just looking at the question, um, I understand the point that the gain realized probably would have been more if they had sold the stock in February as opposed to in March. Right. Um, right. But uh, I think either way, they, they are still looking for a tax deferral strategy or some sort of tax advantage vehicle through which to invest. Um, to the extent that they're looking to do that at all, I mean, their their options are to do that or pay taxes on it uh, this in upcoming year. So um, I think where the real uh, opportunity uh, slash challenge for our spaces right now is to do exactly what Catherine just said, is to message around the importance of um, if, in fact, what we think happened did happen, which is this huge realization of gains in March. Um, and investors are interested in looking at tax advantage vehicles uh, that have a long term hold uh, where investments into assets that are counter cyclical in nature uh, may be, um, you know, preferable or appealing, then Opportunity Zones sure provides a great vehicle through which to do that. But um, also identifying this real need for. Uh, providing relief to small businesses, businesses in general in this moment, as well as um, community projects that may be on hold for the foreseeable future due to uh, state and local uh, budget shortfalls. And very specifically identifying where opportunities and equity can provide a real but for scenario um, and a real relief line to those businesses and to help move those projects forward and the importance of doing that and the importance of doing that in a community aligned way. So we're going to be continuing to, uh, to talk about that messaging, um, push that out, work with a lot of the communities that, that we talked about earlier during the presentation to um, ensure that that's reflecting what they're seeing on the ground and figure out how we can best support those efforts to get that capital um, into their into their neighborhoods in the most responsible and reflective way possible. Great, thanks, Rachel. And there's a follow up question here about will will this kind of public health crisis permanently shift capital from securities markets to opportunity zones? And um, you know, curious on your thoughts on that. I, I don't think we're anticipating a, a full shift there, but we're just hoping that opportunity zones is seen. Um, as a tool um, for investors um, that have realized capital gains, um, you know, perhaps earlier on, uh, you know, to see this as a, a real tool to um, help uh, put their capital and deploy their capital into, um, you know, projects that do have a kind of community uh, orientation and a social impact orientation to them, um, and hopefully will meet, help meet unique community needs in the wake of this as well. Yeah, I, I think we're dealing with an investor uh, or investment marketplace that, due to all the uncertainty, may be a little more conservative than usual um, and uh, is, is watching what happens next before placing capital. But the good news is that they have 180 days to do that. And, um, you know, I, I think the other sort of dual thing that we're fighting here is a continued uh, perception around risk of investing into distressed communities. And luckily we have now a, you know, a year's worth of track record of opportunity zone investments into communities, into distressed communities, where we can point to at least some, some sort of traction or track record that, that this activity is occurring. So, um, so it's more than we had the year before. So it's something to start with, but just knowing that that prior to that hurdle of getting money into these opportunity funds, uh, we're likely dealing with uh, some some uncertainty from investors as well as uh, the ever present uh, perception of risk of investing in distressed communities and having to message around that as well. Great. Well, we are exactly at 2 p.m. Eastern, I should say, <laughs> um, at the end of our webinar. Um, so thank you all very much for joining. Um, I hope we got to the vast majority of questions that were received on the chat. Apologies if you did not 
if we weren't able to make it to your question, um, but our email addresses are here on the screen, feel free to reach out at any time. Thank you again to Lindsay and Main Street America for partnering uh, with us on this webinar. Um, and one final reminder that we will be recording, or we have recorded this, and we will be uh, circulating uh, this recording and the resources within it uh, to all registrants um, in a few days after the call. So thank you all again, um, and uh, we look forward to hopefully connecting with you all again soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.